Hello everybody, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sounding. Today we're going to continue our discussion of audio size compression by talking about some real world-ish methods um, that are used to compress audio. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well out there and I think there's nothing much for it but to just dive into it. So let's do that. So you know, the compression methods we'll talk about today start very simple. And what I want to try to emphasize as I go through them is this idea of sort of a model and residue version of compression. And the easiest place to start probably is with sort of stereo compression, because a lot of audio tracks recorded in the real world have, or synthesized or whatever, have a left and right psychoacoustically that's a real thing and it turns out that if you listen to the left and right channel of a stereo recording a lot of times they are pretty similar there's not a ton of difference even at a sample level between the left track and the right track and that suggests an obvious sort of factor of two-ish compression plan so the idea is that since these channels are so highly correlated, what we're going to do is take a stereo pair and take and, and turn it from a left and a right sample into a center and a different sample. And you know, so we the the center channel is going to be the average of the left and right channels, and then that side channel is going to literally just be a residue from that model. Uh, it'll be you know the the side channel will say how much bigger the left and the right, the left is than the right. So we take the left amplitude and subtract the right amplitude, and that gives us a sort of residue that is a side channel for the stereo. And uh, that's really common in the music world. Uh, CD did not choose to do that, and to this day I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, but Radio, for example, uh, FM stereo, this is absolutely how FM stereo is transmitted. Center channel and a side channel. One of the big advantages of that approach, you know, besides the fact that the side channel is typically low amplitude and so it can be transmitted with less information, uh, is that a lot of times you really want to listen to a stereo signal as mono because you only have one output or whatever. And in that situation, you just throw the side channel away and you've got a perfectly good center channel that can be used as a mono. So, you know, this is partly a convenience, partly a compression scheme, but it's about as simple as it gets for let's make the audio a little small. Uh, another thing relates back to stuff we've been talking about earlier, which is that it's pretty straightforward to do sample rate conversion to a lower sample rate. And when we were talking about that, one of the things we noticed is that, well, yeah, I mean, if you have half the sample rate, you have half the sample size, half the stream size. Um, and so that sounds great. Of course, you lose the high frequencies. And if you want lossy, that is probably the most common lossy compression scheme is to say, you know what, we're just going to throw away those high frequencies away altogether and just transmit the lower frequencies by resampling downward. And again, this is sort of trivially easy to do, uh, you know, as we saw earlier, and it has some nice advantages. Uh, people are used to listening to band limited audio. And so band limiting isn't that noticeable until it gets severe. And the information content tends to be larger per unit sample at the higher frequencies. And so this very simple frequency domain scheme is great. Also, real world audio tends to have a lot more energy at lower frequencies than higher. And so your model's gonna be pretty good even if you downsample quite a bit. Um, now, of course, if you try to downsample too far, if I take my 48,000 sample per second audio that's got a max of 24 kilohertz and downsample it to, you know, 8,000 samples per second, four kilohertz, I'm gonna to start to notice pretty hard 
this doesn't sound right. So it's a lossy compression scheme. It starts to get kind of sketch. One possibility is just a residue code. Just say, well, okay, I'm gonna send the low frequency, the downsampled version of the signal, along with some information to try to reconstruct those higher frequencies. And that is less common, but the thing you can do. I mean, this is especially cool since like we've talked about a bunch, you know, just because you have 48,000 samples per second doesn't mean you have any high frequency components at all. Um, and it may be that some other thing in the signal chain is going to remove them anyhow. Uh, electric guitar pedals and amplifiers tend to roll off pretty sharply around 12 kilohertz. They don't, they almost never go any higher than that. And so if you've got a guitar pedal in your chain, you might as well downsample to 24,000 samples per second because you're not going to get anything interesting about uh, this is actually surprisingly closely related to what MP3 does. We'll talk about MP3 in a bit, but MP3 is a compression scheme that really takes advantage of the difference in representation at different frequencies to try to get some compression out. Compressing in the time domain is also a thing taking advantage of some of these ideas about hearing and transmission and the most simple trick I know of for that is this idea that, well, you know, for human hearing, small differences in large amplitudes matter less. Uh, human hearing is log amplitude, and so small variances in a loud noise, eh, who cares? And from a signal processing point of view, yeah, the, the idea that we want to concentrate our precision down in the bottom where it matters is a reasonable idea. And for those reasons, what we typically do is sort of squash the encoding so that there are fewer codes for larger amplitudes instead of a normal 16-bit number where, you know, each increment of that 16-bit number does the same thing. We do a nonlinear squash where as the signal goes up in amplitude, you know, each step is worth um, a lot more. And so... To do that, we squash the encoding so there are fewer cards for large amplitudes. And the, the classic schemes for this are schemes from telephony called MULA and ALA. Uh, they are very similar schemes. MULA is used in, the, in US telephone stuff. ALA is used in much of the rest of the world's telephone stuff. But they're very, very similar schemes. They both have the same idea. And the idea of a MULA scheme is that I want to take, in the case of MULA, it's specified to take 14 bits in uh, and get 8 bits out in the time domain without thinking about anything except just squashing the code so that the codes are unevenly distributed in that 8-bit space and I get a reasonable approximation of the input that way. So the continuous version of MULA, if you go look at the standard, is defined like this. We take the sign of the signal and multiply, you know, literally minus one or one, depending on whether the signal is positive or negative. We multiply it by this ratio of logarithms. This is just a normalizing factor on the bottom. This thing up on the top is the log, effectively, of the signal times some compression thing. So here, mu is 255 because we're going to encode into eight bits. So that I'm going to get a number out of this between minus 127 and 127 that actually between 0 and 255 I'd have to correct it later a number between 0 and 255 that is sort of the log encoding of my 14-bit input so that's kind of cool uh, again the one plus here is all just a fiddle factor so that our logarithm never goes negative uh, the log of 0 if you'll recall is undefined and the log of you know numbers close to zero is negative and so here we're just saying no 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 we want to have the log always be and so and notice this defined in terms of the natural logarithm really interesting why they chose so in practice of course you're not doing a bunch of log computations per sample what you're doing in practice is you have a big table, and in fact, the standard for MULA encoding has a big table that gives 
you know, sort of a, an exact representation for each possible 14-bit input of what 14-bit output is supposed to be, but it's sort of a table derived from And so if you look at sort of plain old telephone service, what telephone service looked like for everybody back in the days when it was all with wires or telephone service as it looks today over some audio compressed link, but, you know, as it looks like for digital telephony. Uh, the sort of standard starting compression plan is first to down sample to 8,000 samples per second. Uh, so four kilohertz maximum input. And then we MULA encode our 14 bit input notionally to eight bits. So we end up with 64,000 bits per second, 8,000 times eight. Um, and, or if you prefer eight K bytes per second of audio, which that's not a terrible rate compared to what we're doing with other things. And yes, it's lossy. It's lossy in time. It's lossy in amplitude, but it turns out that for voice in particular, which is what most people care about in telephony mostly, for voice, it sounds fine. It's absolutely acceptable. Now, if you listen to telephone conversations, you know, stuff through the system, you can definitely tell the difference. And if you're looking for a telephone effect, you typically do downsampling to some very low sample rate and then muon coding. And that actually pr produces that sort of telephone sound effect pretty effectively, even before you do things like add noise to represent potential line noise or whatever. Um, simulate a carbon button, terrible mic. And notice this really was originally, it was you built a circuit that approximated this MULA scheme. You band limited with analog filters. This was originally an analog system back when the phone, you know, back before computers were used at all in telephony. The digital thing is just let's reproduce this in a digital system, which is interesting. Uh, FLAC, the free lossless audio codec, is a great example of a modern lossless audio encoder that tries to do better things. Uh, FLAC is also nice because it's open source and patent free and generally is something you can study. I would encourage people who are interested in compression to take a look at what it does. Uh, and what it does is something we talked about earlier. It, it tries to build a um, either a polynomial model or a linear predictive code. That is something that tries to predict based on the last batch of samples what the next one's going to be and uses that as its sparse model. By the way, that's a common theme in uh, compression is to try to build several sparse models and send whichever one comes out the smallest and most accurate. There's a lot of that kind of gameplay. And the residue then from that model is encoded because we want to be lossless with a thing called Gollum Rice codes, which are related to Huffman codes, but are more efficient typically for audio. And, you know, reliably when you run FLAC, you get a compression of about a factor of Reliably get the audio file out. This is about half the size. Not perfectly half the size all the time. It obviously, it depends a lot on what audio you're stuffing in, but it's pretty good. I mean, the problem, of course, the reason that we're doing that is because noise must be compressed and recreated also. That snare and the snare drum that I was talking about, really you're, you, you, you were committed to being lossless, so you're required to reproduce that sample for sample. Fairly high amplitude. Looks just completely unpredictable model for it. Pick what your sample's gonna be. The other sort of family of approaches is probably personified by the venerable MP3 standard, which has been the primary lossy audio compression standard for forever. People do other things. Uh, the Vorbis family of audio codecs that are DPL three codecs, but really, you know, the world is 
to lay down three. There's a nice tutorial here I've linked to about how MP3 works. I'm not gonna give you deep detail today on MP3 uh, because it's a very complicated standard and very fancy, but I can give you some of the things. So you start by, this is gonna be a frequency domain encoding very much in a lot of ways. So you're gonna start by taking the audio and splitting up into many frequency bands using something called a polyphase filter. And the polyphase filter has the nice property that uh, if you break the sample into bands with a polyphase filter and then recombine, then you end up with exactly the original sample. So it's not a brick wall reconstruction filter, but it's a, but it's a perfectly, the, 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 the transition bands overlap in such a way that it's a, it's a, you don't lose information. And in each band, you use an FFT to figure out what's going on. You try to figure out, or a DCT thing to figure out what's going on. You want to figure out what frequencies are in that band. Um, you use a DCT to get a power spectrum. And if your thing seems to be mostly noise, if there aren't sharp peaks in the power spectrum, then you encode it using special noise frame stuff. Uh, you quantize the spectrum. So you know, you're going to have power errors due to noise. So, you know, instead of using 16 bits per sample of frequency, and from, you know, 16 bits of frequency information per, per uh, frequency, you, you might quantize down to eight somehow. And so that there's going to be that kind of game. Play. And then you're going to Huffman encode the quantized coefficients, and that gives you a compact representation of that subband. And so you take all those... Subband coefficients, now you've got a frame of compressed audio, and uh, that's your model that you send. And you're not sending the residue here, you're just sending the model. And so you have the potential to have pretty high compression rates. The question really is, you know, are you going to get something that sounds like the original? It turns out that for reasonable compression rates, factors of four to six to eight, uh, you know, it's very close sounding most humans, uh, difference between an MP3 and or, or the original signal. Um, as it starts to get worse, more people are going to hear it, and the difference is more obvious. Once you've heard the difference between applause, for example, on MP3 and applause from the signal, you won't be able to unhear it, so you should watch out for that. Um, so great with applause. So great with that are just hard for a lot of things. It does. So that's some compression schemes that you might find in the real world. I, you know, it's just scratching the surface. Compression, audio compression is a hugely complex topic. There's a ton to say. I would encourage you, if you're interested in it, to go ahead and explore it to deep, deeper. It's quite the right. For now, that's what I've got for you. I hope it was useful. Like I, say, I hope you're doing well out there, and I'll talk to you again soon.